safe. Uh, Pastor Austin is here with us this evening, and so, yay! And so, as he and I are taking turns leading, we'll be up front, but we'll take our masks off, um, but we'll be far enough away. Again, but however, I do invite all of y'all just to leave your masks on, again, for safety and for love of our neighbors. I don't think I have any announcements. Do I have any announcements? I'm looking at people that should know. Do I have, do I have any announcements? All right. Uh, we'll get back into it. We'll figure out what the announcements are eventually. <laughs> but um, for now, my friends, welcome. It's so good to have you all here. And let us continue and prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. Christ, 
given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show a perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, 
and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For then this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege of not only believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Glory be to you, O Lord. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them to his vineyard. When he went out again about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And the landowner went out again about noon, and about three o'clock he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out, and he found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, Go also into the vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last only worked an hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But the landowner replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am so generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. My friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I gotta say, Jonah is one of my most favorite books in the Old Testament. Because Jonah, he is my kind of missionary. He's reluctant, he's withdrawn, and he is stubborn. Never quite ready to go to Nineveh. All over the Bible, people are getting up and going, right? Abraham and Sarah, they move out on a promise and a prayer. Moses heads to Egypt with nothing but a shepherd's crook and Aaron to help him write his sermons. Elijah stands defiant, facing 450 Baal prophets, but not Jonah. Jonah needs to be pushed constantly by God to do his work for God. And all over the New Testament, people are getting up and following Jesus. Fishermen are dropping their nets. Tax collectors are forgetting all about credit and debit. And others are leaving their parents behind. Even after a dramatic conversion, a man once called Saul, turned Paul, travels throughout the Mediterranean, spreading the word. But not Jonah. Jonah needs to be pushed constantly by God to do his work for God. And why do I love the book of Jonah? Because, because in Jonah, Jonah I see the really real parts of humanity. humanity. In, in Jonah, Jonah, I see and I know that God works through even the most stubborn parts of us. The most stubborn parts of me. For Jonah, there's something that causes him to resist his call. It holds him back. And it's totally legitimate 
why Jonah would be so stubborn. And yet God works through him and the circumstances anyway. Which can be the same with us, right? Sometimes there's something holding us back as well. Sometimes we too can be reluctant, withdrawn, and stubborn for one reason or another. Not doing what we know God wants us to do in this world. And for Jonah, the reason for his obstinance was simply Nineveh. But why was Nineveh the problem? I mean, it's just another foreign land, right? And certainly, going to a foreign land is never easy. I know many of you have spent time outside of the States, and you could probably tell great stories about differences in what it means to be in a foreign land, a different culture. And for that matter, Chandler and I both have roots in the Carolinas, and I grew up in Vermont. But when we moved to Pennsylvania, which is where we were right before coming to Asheville, let me tell you, we were in a foreign land. <laughs> but Jonah's problem wasn't with that it was just a foreign land. Jonah's problem was Nineveh, period. Now, we all have people we don't get along with. And maybe if pushed, some of us could claim that we even have enemies. For Jonah, it was Nineveh. In the context of our story, the Ninevites had destroyed Jonah's family and homeland. Nineveh was a city on the east bank of the Tigris River in Assyria, in modern northern Iraq. The Assyrians, they were not too popular in Israel, because during the 8th and 7th centuries before Christ, they plundered all of Palestine, looting and burning its cities, deporting its inhabitants. In the years between 722 and 721 before Christ, the northern kingdom of Israel passed out of existence completely as a result of the Syrian conquest. In other words, to Jonah, Nibia was the object of intense hostility. Go to Nineveh. God says. And Jonah says, anywhere, Lord. Send me anywhere but Nineveh. And so Jonah needs to constantly be pushed by God to do the work, his work for God. And Jonah doesn't just ignore God. Jonah, like, runs the other way, right? You know this story. Jonah jumps on a boat that's heading to the opposite direction of Nineveh. But God pursues Jonah. God sends a storm to remind Jonah that he has work to do. Jonah jumps overboard to protect the innocent men aboard the ship. The storm stops. A giant fish sent by God rescues Jonah by swallowing him up. And in the belly of the large fish, Jonah prays to God and thanks God for remembering him, remembering him in his times of distress. And then after three days and three nights, the fish spits Jonah back out onto land closer to Nineveh, and God tries again with Jonah. God tries again with Jonah. Like, this is huge and amazing grace to me. It's grace and challenge all rolled into one. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Arise and go to Nineveh. Are there any kind of words written anywhere in in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God never lets up and never gives up on Jonah. God never lets up and never gives up on us. Grace and challenge, forgiveness and responsibility, it's all intertwined. But again, we know the story, right? Jonah doesn't just hop up now and say, okay, okay, God, off to Nineveh I go, and skips away merrily into the city. This is real human drama at its most humanness, I think. Off he goes to Nineveh, all right. But I have this image of, of Jonah kind of slouching his way into Nineveh. He's dragging his feet the whole way. He, he goes reluctantly. And he only goes part way, not even halfway. It's a three days journey from one side of Nineveh to the other side. Jonah goes a day's journey into the city. And then, as I like to imagine, kind of half-heartedly, half-hoping that no one in Nineveh will listen and God will level the city with his mighty wrath, Jonah shares the word of God of, of warning to repent to the Ninevites. 
And after preaching his oh-so-brief message, Jonah left Nineveh and perched himself up on the east of the city to see what would happen next. No doubt hoping that the Ninevites would not change and God would blast that awful city into oblivion. But instead, the whole town comes forward singing songs of repentance. And Jonah just doesn't quite know what to do with all of that. Jonah wants God to blow that whole place to the side. Because, because Jonah, Jonah could never, never understand about God's great forgiveness. He never, never quite, quite understood, understood that, that there's a wideness in God's, God's mercy. And then, then God, God turns, turns his attention to Jonah. And Jonah's, and Jonah's given a plan to provide him with shade. The following day, however, God sends a word to smite the plant, along with a sultry east wind to be down on Jonah's head. Taking advantage of Jonah's acute discomfort, God slips in with a lesson. God says to Jonah, Are you so deeply grieved about the plant? Yes, says Jonah. I can hear my son saying this part. Yes, so deeply that I want to die. He's just being miserable, just for the sake of misery, right? And then the Lord says, you care about the plant, which you did not work for, which you did not grow, which appeared overnight and perished overnight. And should I not care about Nineveh, that great city? in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not yet know their right hand from their left, and many beasts as well? Just as the giant fish was commissioned to place Jonah's feet back on the path of the prophet, so too I think the wind, the worm, and the weed are all commissioned to place Jonah back on the path of compassion and to remind him that God alone decides whom God will give mercy. And we never know, in fact, how John, Jonah responds to God's question. Because that's the end of the book of Jonah. The matter is left completely open-ended, without response and without resolve. And this may actually be really purposeful. Whatever the case may be, the purpose, but there's one thing that's clear. The Ninevites are not the only ones pursued by God's mercy in this story. God stays with Jonah, the bitter, unforgiving prophet, extending mercy to the merciless and compassion to the one whose heart is set on wrath. And so, too, God will pursue, is pursuing us with mercy, forgiveness, and love. When we are reluctant to follow God's call, when we are reluctant to forgive, when we are reluctant to love, God's mercy, forgiveness, and love are anything but reluctant, far from it. God's mercy, forgiveness, and love are active in pursuing us, our family members, our friends, our neighbors we don't even know. And yes, even those we don't like and those we would call our enemies, God's mercy and love and forgiveness are there always, given to us extravagantly and abundantly as only our God can and will. So from the story of Jonah, I learned that in my stubbornness, in those times that I'm dragging my feet or feeling lukewarm or half-hearted about God's call to do God's work in this world, God is working anyway. God is working in my reluctance. God is working in my frustrations. God is working in the abundant and extravagant ways that God does. And so may you hear the same good news, that when you are reluctant or frustrated or stubborn or just want to ignore what you think God is calling you to do, may you hear that, like Jonah, God isn't giving up on you. God is pursuing you with mercy, forgiveness, and love. And God will continue to work through you 
even when we are defiant and obstinate, which happens because we're human, God will work through you. And for that matter, may we all hear the good news that God is always working in the midst and through all of God's creation. God's work, never, God never ceases to work and move and push and pull and pursue, no matter how reluctant, withdrawn, or stubborn. God's abundant mercy, forgiveness, and love is always there and always working in our world. My friends, this is good news. God is working through us. The humans that we are, just as God worked through Jonah, the reluctant, withdrawn, and stubborn prophets. Amen. Yes. 
seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My friends, let us pray for ourselves and others. Almighty God, you have promised to hear us when we pray. Therefore, in confidence and trust, we pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Good and gracious and loving Lord, we lift before you all of those in our lives and in our world who are struggling in little and large ways. We lift before you those who are sick, who are caregivers, who are running out of energy, who are struggling with the day in and day out of virtual school, while also trying to work full time, who are worried about their income and their small businesses, who are worried about the future. Oh Lord, we lift before you all of those that are anxious and all of those that carry fear, whether they name it out loud or not. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Good and gracious God, in the midst of all the chaos that seems to surround us, help us to also see your beauty. Help us to see your beauty in creation. Help us to see your beauty in the smiling eyes of behind masks. Help us to see your beauty in how we interact with each other. Offer compassion and care. Take care of one another. Help us, O oh Lord, to be your beauty in this world especially in these days and weeks, months of chaos. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. O oh, good and gracious God, help us to be kind. Help us to open our hearts and our minds, even in ways that are challenging for us, O oh Lord, especially now especially in this country. Help us to be kind to one another, to those with different opinions on all sorts of matters. Help us to be kind. Help us to see the other as you see them, as your beloved child. Help us to love in the midst of stress, and help us to be kind in the midst of pain and fear. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is free. O oh Lord, you have called us to serve you. Grant that we may walk in your presence, your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills. Transform us by your truth. And give us language to proclaim your gospel through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please find a safe way to share the peace with your neighbors. and the wine are un- 
under here. And the holy imagination, the holy goodness that is God, will bless all of this through cotton. And then before you come up to receive, I will remove the cotton fabric. That way we will, we will just offer one more layer of protection to keep each other safe. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our privilege and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who comes to us in this meal, even through a thin layer of cotton, and plastic cups. Jesus, who comes to us in this meal, the humans that we are with all of our foibles and, and stubbornness. Jesus, who comes to us just as we are in this meal. And the beautiful thing about this meal, one of the beautiful things about this meal, is that in this meal, Jesus meets us as we are, loves us as we are, and says, I love you enough to not let you stay that way because I want you to be better and do better in this meal. And so we gather here time and time again because on the night in which he was betrayed by a friend, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did not run from death, but he stayed at the table and he offered life. He took bread. He blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his friends and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And only briefly did the power of this broken world seem to have won because Jesus did not stay dead. And in his resurrection, we too have the promise of everlasting life. So we can proclaim with joy in our hearts, Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My friends, this is the table of our God. It is made ready for those who love God and for those who want to love God more. So come, you who have much faith and you who want to have more faith. You who know joy and you who know pain. You who have followed well and you who have struggled to follow. You who have loved your neighbors well and you who have found it difficult to do so. Come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is God's will that those who want to should meet God here. I invite you to please sit for some brief instruction. So what we're going to do um, is we'll start with this side, and y'all will come forward, and you will receive a, a cup filled with a wafer, and then a cup filled with wine. And then you'll go back to your seat and then sit down and receive as you sit down. I would suggest taking the lid off of the cup with the wafer, eating the wafer, then putting the wine in that cup, and then drinking the wine. And then as you leave this evening, there's a garbage can for your garbage. So I apologize, just hold on to your garbage for a few more minutes till the end of the service. If you um, require or would prefer um, gluten-free or grape juice, those things are found on the front of the plate, and they're very clearly labeled. So I'm just going to ask you to take which elements fit what you need as you come forward. And so, my friends, let us eat and drink, for the feast is now ready.
Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, remembering that Jesus has said, I am with you always to the end of the age. The God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the God of all grace, bless us now and forever. <laughs>